This morning we're going to be jumping in in the uh, fourth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Let's take a few moments this morning and remember where we've been. As we began our study of Nehemiah, it was with the backdrop of uh, being in a position as a body, as a church, where we were looking, uh, seeking to understand God's vision, what's, what's next for us, where is God working, uh, where is God calling us uh, into that work, what are, what are the needs around us, where do we need to step in and step up to accomplish God's plans and purposes. And it's really the, the same question that Nehemiah uh, was in. You remember that in chapter 1, the condition of the people uh, in Jerusalem came to his attention. The land was vulnerable. Uh, there, were, there was brokenness in the land. They, they lacked security living there in Jerusalem. They really had no hope and no future. They, they didn't have a way that they could see to, to change things. And what I'd like us to remember from chapter 1 is Nehemiah's response, the fact that it was a response of, of anguish. You remember we read that he mourned and fasted and prayed for days. As we got into chapter 2 when he approached the king, we recognized that for four months he had carried this burden and he had continually poured this burden out before the Lord and, and made himself available. Thinking this week about the word anguish, you know, you can almost feel the impact of the word when you say it. It's not a word that you would say with a smile on your face. It's not a word that you say lightly, but it, it feels heavy and it feels burdensome. Nehemiah's concern for the people and his willingness to do something before he even knew what to do arose from his anguish. The distress he was under, the suffering and, and the pain. As I thought about anguish this week, I thought, you know, that, that's what I need. That's what we need. We need to feel anguish over the brokenness of people around us. God is anguished far beyond anything we can imagine. We could never possibly carry the burden of anguish that God has over those who are separated from him, but we certainly need to ask God to bring us to a point of anguish over the lostness of people around us. We, we need the heart of God. And I would say we're probably never closer to the heart of God than when we're in anguish over the, the broken, the spiritually destitute. And God moves. When our heart is like the heart of God, God moves. God gave Nehemiah audience with the king, and, and from that encounter gave Nehemiah all the materials and all the authority necessary to rebuild the wall. When, when what's on God's heart is what's on our heart, God moves. God placed that burden on Nehemiah. And you see in the second chapter that we looked at about three weeks ago that God gave him a very specific plan. Nehemiah had already agreed uh, to be used by God, and then God gave him a very specific plan as he returned to Jerusalem. God used Nehemiah to, to rally the people. Uh, chapter 3, the week before last, we saw that the people were working together, all, all of the people of every age, male and female, people with different abilities, uh, different jobs, different skills. The key phrase in chapter 3 was this phrase, next to him. And everyone was doing their part and working together. Well, the story could have stopped right there. Nehemiah in chapter 3 describes how the wall was completed, who did what part. It's a wonderful story of, of triumph. It's an encouraging story for anyone who is uh, seeking to walk with the Lord and accomplish his purposes. But it wasn't that simple, and it wasn't that easy. It usually isn't simple or easy. You know when you walk with the Lord, when you're attempting to accomplish the vision he's given, there will be challenges, there will be difficulties, there will be hurdles that have to be overcome. And that's what we see in chapter 4 today. You could title the chapter, Here Comes Trouble. There's been a hint of trouble in chapter 2, but now the opposition is heating up. Look with me in chapter 4, just the first Three verses. Now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria. Now, he wasn't speaking this directly to Nehemiah and the people. He was speaking to his compatriots, the, the army of Samaria, his brothers, those that, that rallied around him, and, and making fun of them and getting them to laugh at the Jews. Here's what he said What are these feeble Jews doing? 
Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. Well, Sam Ballot literally is saying, listen, the, these people are too feeble. The, the word would be that they're uh, withered and miserable. This remnant of people is, is a withered and, and miserable group of people. They, they have nothing. And of course, the enemy can't see the resources that God's people have. And you remember that Scripture makes it clear that God delights in, in using the feeble and in using the foolish to confound the wise and to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. When we're weak, he's strong. Zenbalat says, look, their, their work is worthless. They can't restore the city. They, they can't protect themselves. It's going to take more than, than sacrifices and prayer to get this thing done. He's basically saying their God is not going to respond to them. It doesn't matter how much they sacrifice and how much they pray. God's not going to help them. They, they're not going to finish in a day. Can they even revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? And he talked about the stones being burnt. Most of the stones were, were, were limestone, and they were ruined by the fire. Basically, Sam Ballot's saying they don't have any idea what they're doing and, and what they've gotten into. And then his, his sidekick, his buddy Tobiah. You know, I, I thought about Sam Ballot and Tobiah, and, and I picture them. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the movie. You probably have if you have children or grandchildren, the movie Beauty and the Beast. There's these two characters in, in Beauty and the Beast, Gaston and Le Fou. You remember them? San Ballad, in my mind, is kind of like Gaston. He's the big, brawny, upfront, mouthy guy. And then he's got this pesky little sidekick, LeFou. That's, that's who I think Tobiah represents, LeFou. He kind of chimes in on San Ballad and says, yeah, yeah, what they're building, even if a fox got on it, 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 it would knock it down. You know, and San Ballad and Tobiah were absolutely correct from a human perspective. This remnant of people was indeed weak and poor, and they weren't up to the task, and, and the work was greater than them. But whose project is this? Is it the project of the people of Judah? Is it the project of Nehemiah? No, God called them to this task. Nehemiah reminds them that God is greater. He uses that phrase that he used back in chapter 1 in his prayer. He's the great and awesome Lord. If you go back to chapter 3, you'll, you'll find if you read through and count them up, if you go to back to chapter 3, there are 41 sections of wall that are being worked on. And unity next to him, what we saw in chapter 3, unity was the key to their success in building that wall. All Sen Ballot hoped to do was maybe to get one or two sections, one or two units, and demoralize them, and that would have a domino effect. They had to be together. They had to stay together. They had to work together. You notice that Nehemiah doesn't even take any time to respond to their taunts. He, he simply prays. Look in verse 4. We'll read next verses 4 through 6. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt. Let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. And then he simply says, So we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Now, when you look at that prayer Nehemiah prayed, before you see him as a, a vengeful leader and you decide he wants his enemies crushed and destroyed, understand his ultimate objective in that prayer is asking God to vindicate himself. Nehemiah and the people are trying to be faithful to God. They're trying to, to finish the task. And to fail at this task, to leave the people of Jerusalem in, in shame, would bring God's name into disrepute. Because these are his people. These nations around know that God claims to care for his people and, and to meet their needs. So Nehemiah in this prayer is asking God to protect his own reputation by judging those who are acting unrighteously and mistreating his people. But he never responds to the taunt. He simply prays to God, and verse 6 says, The resolve is strong. The work is joined together. The wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. So they kept on, and they stayed faithful. 
They were encouraged by Nehemiah. Nehemiah simply prayed, and then they continued the work. So, of course, as you would expect, Satan has his minions double down on them. If you look in verses 4 through 8, there are four different groups, one in the north, one in the south, one in the east, the west, four different groups that have formed an alliance and, and come together threatening to fight against the workers. Look at verse 9. Nehemiah simply says, we prayed to our God and set a guard. Now, that's a common theme you see throughout the book of Nehemiah as they're building the wall. They pray and they prepare. They pray and, and they work or defend. What's happening here? What happens is when we're serving God, when we're following his plan, it shouldn't surprise us that Satan always opposes the work of God. Satan always opposes the work of God. In fact, maybe a good sign that you're following God's plan and purpose is when Satan begins to oppose you. He always opposes the work of God. And if we understand that, we should never underestimate the power of prayer. The first thing Nehemiah did was not speak back to the enemies. The first thing he did was not prepare a, a battle plan. The first thing he did was to pray. He prayed and then set a guard. The urgency of the need should never eliminate taking time to pray. You know, you know what happens with us? We get confused and, and we think that the real work is our activity and prayer is an auxiliary or supplemental effort. No. Prayer is the work. It prepares us and it, and it directs our activity. But listen, we need to be careful that prayer doesn't become a substitute for action or a substitute for fulfilling our duty. Now, honestly, m most often what we do is we rush into work doing what we know to do. But then the other side of that is there are times that we know what the work is and we know what to do and we don't really want to do the work so we think it's okay to just pray. What am I talking about? Well, here's a prime example. We know that we are called, that one of the works we don't have to pray about, one of the works that we are called to do is evangelism the sharing of our faith, not, not the bringing someone to church to preach and hear a preacher preach how to be saved, but the personal, individual sharing of our faith. We know that that's a work we're called to do, but it, it's hard, and it's scary, and, and sometimes we don't feel competent, so what do we do? We just pray for the lost and ask God not to make us go have to dig around in the rubble, Right? We don't want to get our hands dirty. We don't want to be at ground zero. We just from a distance pray for those who are lost and ask God to send someone who'd be willing to dig around in the rubble and help rebuild and show them where life is found. I thought this week about the story that I heard a pastor tell about a deacon in his church, an older deacon, and, and this pastor would frequently call on this deacon to pray at the end of the service. And every time this deacon prayed, he would always close his prayer with this, and Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger. And this pastor said one Sunday, he prayed his typical phrase, Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger, and then it got real quiet. People began to look around, and the pastor kind of looked and peeked up. He didn't know if the guy had had a heart attack or stroked out or what had happened. He just stopped. And finally, the pastor ever walked over to him and said, Brother, are you okay? And the man said, Yes. But when I said, Lord, touch the unsaved with thy finger, I felt God say to me in my spirit, You are the finger. We must pray, but we can't shirk from our duty or, or, or our responsibility in that. Nehemiah prayed, and they prepared, and, and then they set themselves to the task. But then there's another attack from a different front. It was not an external attack from these enemies of what God was doing with his people in this land, but it was actually an attack from within the camp. Look in verse 10. In Judah... It was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There's too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. Now, that Hebrew where it says the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing, the, the picture there is of a, of a man 
trying to carry a huge load of stones, and he's, he, he's stumbling, he's staggering, his, his strength is giving way. They've been under tremendous pressure from without because of Sanballat and Tobiah and this alliance that has been formed against them. And, and under that tremendous pressure, there's beginning to be problems within. They're looking around and saying, you know, they're, they're right. We can't do this. Discouragement is one of the greatest weapons or tools that Satan has in his arsenal. We're not able, they said. And that's a natural response anytime we take our eyes off the Lord. What happened when the Israelites, the first time, were going to go into the promised land? They took their eyes off the Lord and they put their eyes on what those ten spies said, that there were giants in the land and they couldn't take them. What happened when Peter had enough faith to ask Jesus, let me come to you. If that's you, let me come to you. And he began to walk on the water. And when did he sink? When he took his eyes off Jesus. And so there was this incredible discouragement. And, and as we look at ourselves at time and our abilities, as we look at the, the problems that we're facing, as we count on our own abilities, that's going to diminish our faith. It's going to slow or even stop the work of God in us and through us when we're looking at ourselves. So what, what does Nehemiah do? If you'll glance back down after verse 10, what does Nehemiah do in response to these naysayers? He goes right on with the work. Doesn't even answer. Just keeps the people at work. Keeps them working together. Down in verse 12, let me, let me explain very quickly what's happening there. Not all of those working on the wall were living in the city of Jerusalem. Now remember that a walled city represented protection and security, but there were some people who lived outside of the city. If you, if you will, there were urban people and rural people. And the rural people outside the city were worried that if they kept this up, if they kept going in spite of the threats, the rural people would be the first to be attacked. And they'd already heard the threats from these enemies that you're not even going to know, you're not even going to see where we're coming from, and, and we're going to attack on, on every front. And so what does Nehemiah do? He does what is practical, and you see this throughout these next several verses. He posts guards at all the points in the wall. He, he instructs the people, look, you're not just to carry your, your work tools. You're to have that in one hand, but a weapon in the other hand, and you've got to be constantly vigilant. You've got to listen for the trumpet call, and when the trumpet is blown, you come to that point, and, and we fight together. And look at verse 14. Again, he reminds them, Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Anytime we find something significant to do for the kingdom of God, we should expect the forces of evil to come against us. We should expect them to attempt to discourage us and, and defeat us. You know, here there were physical evidences of a battle, there was a seen enemy. But you know that the scripture tells us the actual battle is not a flesh and blood battle, but it's a spiritual battle. And spiritual battles require spiritual weapons, and prayer is the weapon. It is, if you will, the nuclear option in the battle. And so when we're facing battles individual, or obstacles individually or, or corporately, we first need to pray. And then secondly, we have to remember God's call on us. Nehemiah knew this, this venture was God's venture. He knew the, the rebuilding of these walls to protect and, and, and bring security to his people. This was on God's heart. Nehemiah had seen God's providence at work back in Susa when he went before the king. He had seen God's providence in his hand at work before he even left for Jerusalem. He had no doubt that God would see them through. And so very simply this morning, if you want application, if you're discouraged, especially in relation to your walk with the Lord and, and your attempt to do for him whatever he's called you to do, to share with a coworker, or a neighbor or family member, to do something in ministry, if you're discouraged and, and you're sensing opposition, very simply the first step is to pray, secondly to remember what God has called you to do, and thirdly move forward in faith. You know, we saw a great example of that, and I mentioned it last Sunday, a great example of that in, in our team that went to India last week. They got back yesterday afternoon, uh, Casey Kraft, uh, Ryan Siemens, who's the third guy? Ross O'Kelly, and then uh, Shirley Manning and Marcy Walker. I've asked Marcy, where are you? Would you join me up here? I, I want us to see in a very practical way what we've just talked about 
in the book of Nehemiah. This team, before they even departed, had some incredible challenges. Marcy, would you, would you take just a minute? I know several on the team, even in days prior to departure, had some issues going on. Like what? Yeah, so we had from physical injuries to sicknesses to pipes breaking to power outages to um, reports and papers due, uh, you name it, we had spiritual warfare physically, emotionally, uh, spiritually attacking probably two weeks prior to us leaving. So, so the five of you recognized there was opposition oh, coming yeah. against you. Yeah. And, and I know because there were a lot of text messages flying back and forth between mm -hmm. us, you guys were, were praying. What were you praying when all that was going on? Well, we, we honestly were praying that, especially during the, the airport, <laughs> We just said, God, we need you to make a way when there doesn't seem to be a way possible. Mm -hmm. And we felt really called to go. And so there never was a doubt that we were going. We just knew that God was going to have to show up and make that way because humanly possible, it, it, it shouldn't you have knew, happened. You knew you couldn't do it. He right. had to make it happen. Okay, let's go to the airport because I, I mentioned this to him last week. Flight delay, delay, delay. You yeah. get to Dallas. You got 30 minutes from one gate, one terminal, get baggage, go through security, go to the other. You and Shirley went on, the guys are back, they finally realize this ain't gonna happen, so they call you and say, how you guys feel about going without your luggage? Yeah. <laughs> and y'all made an instant decision. Yeah, we had no time to, do, to but deliver. But what you said to me when we were texting was, we knew God called us to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did, we, there was no doubt. I mean, even bef before we got off the plane to try to catch the Emirates flight, it was, there was not a doubt that we were going to do everything we could to get on the flight. We, we felt God was calling us to go, so he was going to have to part that sea, basically. And um, whatever came up our way, if it, the only option was to go without our bags. So Shirley and I said, yes, we're, we're going to go. Yeah. So. so Ross and Casey and Ryan and Marcy and Shirley as a team, we're united in the fact God called us to go. We got to go, go regardless. Whether yeah. we have our comforts, what we need, we have to go. Mm -hmm. And you did, and you moved forward in faith. And now tell our folks what happened last week in India. Yeah, so we saw God show up in a mighty way that we, we never could have fathomed. So just some figures of what happened. We were able to reach 48 villages. Over 1,600 people were able to hear the gospel. And some of them, it was their very first time that, mm. to, hear, to even hear the name of Jesus and what he had done for them. And then finally, and most importantly, there were over 400 people who turned from their false idol worship to the one true God as their personal Amen. Lord and Savior. Amen. I told you guys yesterday when you arrived at the airport, I assume you got my message, welcome home warriors. You guys are my heroes. I mean, yeah. to, to think about the fact that all that stuff was happening, there had to be incredible discouragement, and yet you kept pressing forward, and you kept praying, you kept mm -hmm. telling God, hey, it's on you, and then you were willing to make whatever sacrifice you had to make to go and accomplish what God had. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you, team, for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, that. if we hadn't have, we wouldn't have seen God's glory the way it had been. No. Without the opposition, we were able to see God just demonstrate his power. So at the end of it, we were just so thankful that even all of the difficulties and struggles happened because God just revealed himself not only personally, but also to yeah. those. What, what would you have missed? I know, yeah. What would you have missed? Yeah. And let me mention, um, Casey and Marcy and Ryan and Ross and Shirley, if they're in your Sunday school department, your, your small group, you need to let them share, not necessarily this morning, but at some point. If they're not, and you'd like to have one of them come share, if you'll contact Pastor Jason, he'll line that up because folks need to hear the story. Thank yeah. you for your faithfulness. <laughs> Nehemiah is a, uh, when you look at chapter four, it's a, it's a back and forth struggle, and that's just a great analogy for life as a believer. It, it is a continual struggle, and, and we're gonna face real opposition as we live for Christ. And I don't wanna make it too simplistic, but it really is pretty simple. It's exactly what they did. When you face opposition, you pray. God, if this is what you've told me to do, you'll need to make a way. I, I can't do this. And you can't. You're like the weak and feeble Jews. You, you can't do it on your own. You don't have it in you, which is great. 
because God will have to show up. So you pray, and then you remember what you're called to. I'll I'll never forget texting with them in those moments and, and hearing Marcy say, we have to go. That's what God's called us to do. It wasn't about having the clothes and having the luggage and having the comforts. It was about people in India, and you heard her say, some of whom had never heard the gospel, getting to hear the gospel. So what if you have to wear the same clothes for a week if you can help someone avoid hell for all of eternity? You remember the calling, and then you press forward in faith. They didn't know what the outcome was going to be. They didn't know what would happen when they got there. They had no idea. They were just trusting God and moving forward in faith. You pray, you remember what God has called you to, and you move forward in faith. And that is true not only corporately as a body of Christ, but individually in your own life.